Okay, uh, 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 greetings everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Kyoto Aramis Tanemura. Uh, I earned my PhD in the Kenneth M. Mers Jr. Research Group, and now I am in the Guo Weiwei uh, Research Group, both at uh, Michigan State University. And thank you, Nate, for the introduction. Uh, I appreciate all your attendance today's, uh, today for, uh, for today's webinar. Uh, we're very honored to be able to present on our new digital primer in the ACS in Focus series titled Python for Chemists. Uh, the slides are available online at uh, the following link uh, now and in the future. Uh, please feel free to open the slides on your own machine uh, if you prefer to navigate at your own convenience. So leveraging big data in chemistry is of increasing importance in chemistry research. We draw parallels to how the omics fields as uh, data intensive methodologies have transformed uh, biological research and highlight contemporary work in chemistry, uh, which uh, leverage data and algorithms to form uh, 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 chemical tasks at massive scales. We highlight Python as an excellent introductory language for chemists to learn coding. Uh, existing solutions could be reused in Python by importing them as modules. Also, Python syntax is uh, readable, um, uh, simple and readable, uh, uh, and therefore is an excellent starting uh, point. So finally, we describe the motivations and topics covered in the digital primer, uh, Python for chemists. So sometimes it's easier to understand history as an outsider, and uh, we could understand the importance of coding and chemistry uh, by looking at how it transformed a closely related field of biology. Omics fields are uh, areas of biological research which aim for the holistic characterization and quantitation of biological systems. They encompass fields such as genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and so on. It revolutionized bio biology research by providing a unified context and established a quantitative metric across disparate disciplines. Uh, uh, the Human Genome Project here um, uh, accomplished the sequencing of the human genome over the years 1990 to 2003 using Sanger sequencing. Uh, the 3.2 billion base pairs sequence provided a reference map uh, mapping approximately 22,300 protein coding genes to the 23 chromosomes. Uh, phylogenetics uh, was previously performed uh, through uh, fairly qualitative observations of phenotype. Uh, and this has also been transformed by uh, sequencing of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. The 16S uh, RNA, uh, RNA contains highly conserved regions and hypervariable regions. And primers for the conserved regions, therefore, could serve as a universal primer for sequencing the hypervariable regions through amplicon sequencing and map a comprehensive molecular tree of life. Such methodology led to the fundamental discovery of differentiating domains of bacteria from archaea. Uh, also, basic local alignment search tool, or BLAST, is an algorithm which uses dynamic programming to evaluate the similarity in protein sequences or other sequences. Uh, it allows researchers to infer structural or functional similarities between proteins, as well as uh, evolutionary lineage by comparing a uh, given sequence, such as a peptide, to an entire database. So BLAST is now routine for investigating uh, proteins. So each of these historical developments and biological sciences generated a data deluge for which computational methods were necessary to interpret. Computation and biology is no longer regarded as a niche subfield or a gimmick, but rather a pillar for uh, conducting modern bio biological research. And the uh, importance of uh, computation in the scientific toolkit is highlighted in this quote. There is no such thing as a pipette biologist, a microscopy biologist, or a cell culture biologist. These are all merely tools all biologists are entitled to use to investigate their research question. Uh, 
computation is yet another tool for which all biologists are entitled to use. And the same intention applies uh, for chemists. Um, all chemists handle data and can leverage databases uh, or take advantage of databases in their research. And chemists do not have to additionally be um, highly experienced software developers or machine learning engineers to begin using code for their chemistry research. So, <clears throat> uh, algorithms and big data are enabling tasks and chemistry previously considered unfeasible by computers. A uh, chemical reagent has an average of 80 reactions deposited in a database, and total synthesis may involve many uh, sequences of reactions. Thus, for a synthesis with the shortest pass of uh, five steps, over 3 billion sequences of reactions may be uh, considered. So, um, so hand-coded hand uh, reaction rules can intelligently navigate these massive uh, combinatorial spaces of chemical reactions and hypothesize and optimize reaction synthetic pathways in a quantitative manner. The role of computation in high throughput sequencing is well established in drug discovery. Uh, Drug-like molecules are incrementally refined through methods such as uh, quantitative structure activity relationship, molecular docking, and molecular simulations. And the use of virtual screening allows drug candidates to be narrowed down prior to downstream experimental ass assessment and validation. Uh, natural product identification are also not restricted to train uh, chemists to inspect individual spectra uh, to elucidate structures. High throughput instrumentation such as tandem mass spectrometry could query fragmentation spectra um, uh, across uh, databases and unknown structures may also be aligned to uh, similar structures to aid in uh, structure identification. So we no longer weigh paper of uh, signals cut from nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum uh, to uh, spectra to integrate signals. We have software for NMR spec spectral analysis now to automate such analyses. Uh, methodologies evolve with technology and knowing basic computer science uh, allows us to participate in the emerging uh, methodologies rather than to be at the mercy of others to develop the software to advance the frontiers of chemistry research. And as chemists, we have many opportunities to apply uh, data science workflows in novel contexts. It is a, a fertile opportunity. So data science lies at the intersection of three areas of uh, expertise, computer science, uh, subject matter expertise, and math and stati statistics. Uh, as such, it presents a fairly large barrier for many to access the field. Uh, for chemistry researchers, we have domain expertise, as well as uh, many years of um, uh, training in the quantitative disciplines. Therefore, we have a unique access point from traditional research uh, to enter data science by learning um, um, fundamental uh, computer science. So this allow, also allows us to uh, access developing tools, uh, uh, access uh, developing software for our use, as well as capitalize on the rapidly developing collection of algorithms in the field of machine learning. Data science and related topics are certainly not immune from hype. Uh, entry to data science also certainly promises more than permission to use popular buzzword. Uh, when put into the context of the history of scientific paradigms. Uh, Jim Gray of uh, Microsoft described the history of scientific discovery as four paradigms from the empirical, theoretical, simulation, and data-intensive sciences. Subjects in data science, such as artificial intelligence, are uh, not new, uh, dating back uh, to 1956 by uh, John McCarthy. Uh, so while the methodologies are far from new, uh, are far from new fads, uh, rather they are existing approaches uh, which were recently enabled due to the explosion in the availability of data, as well as computational capabilities. As chemists, as scientists, uh, we should have the necessary training to access method methods developed in the current scientific paradigm. 
And Python in particular offers an excellent entry point for chemists uh, to begin using algorithmic methods in their research. Uh, Python was first developed by Guido van Rossum in 1991 and consistently ranks as the most popular programming language. And its popularity be, may be uh, assigned to its uh, simplicity and extendability of functionality. The guiding principles of um, Python could be printed here. Uh, and we see that it has a lot of emphasis on, um, on uh, the ease of development. So there's some points we want to highlight, including um, uh, that uh, readability counts. It's important that it, um, we could easily uh, understand the source code uh, rather than um, using cryptic commands. Um, there should be one, and preferably only one, obvious way to do it. Uh, and that if the implementation is hard to explain, it's a bad idea. So a lot of em emphasis on the simplicity of the Python programming language. So I'd like to highlight some of the um, benefits of using Python through using uh, through um, uh, um, examples. So. Um, here, uh, suppose we are preparing a TRIS HCL buffer with a known um, composition, and the task is to predict the uh, pH of the prepared solution. So we have uh, we could record the uh, mass of the uh, TRIS base and its uh, conjugate acid and the final volume. Um, the pK of uh, TRIS is known, and uh, as well as the molecular weight of the base and the salt. So this is a case we would use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation uh, to solve for the pH from these known quantities. So however, in base Python, we don't have this normal log function uh, implemented. Um, so it would be very inefficient uh, if we have to uh, implement uh, the normal log function uh, each time we need it. And this is uh, one advantage of coding in Python. Code can readily be imported as modules. Uh, thus, we can utilize existing solutions in our code. So rather than Im implementing the normal log function uh, anew, we can import and immediately use it. So let's run this code to save those variables. So here, um, we could use the math module, uh, which contains uh, various uh, variables and functions. Uh, uh, which may appear on a scientific calculator, and we could import log 10, the function log 10. So from here, uh, we uh, calculate the concentration, both of the base and the conjugate acid, and plug those quantities into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation with the log 10 function imported. And we see that we were able to calculate the pH of the solution. So uh, this uh, illustrates the, um, uh, the uh, utility of uh, Python for existing known uh, or uh, already uh, implemented code. Um, and also by operation uh, running these calculations in Python code, we could save the quantities to descriptive variables and document it, uh, our analyses in a, a manner rather than using direct, um, uh, direct cryptic quantities. Another uh, uh, feature of Python that we like as a, a starting language is that it's uh, very readable and concise. So take, for example, uh, we're identifying all stereoisomers of uh, alpha-D glucose. So the smiles um, is a string representation of the structure, and we could use the function from RDKit to visualize that in a, or draw it in a segment formula. as shown here. So uh, alpha-D glucose has uh, these uh, five uh, stereo, stereogenic centers communicated um, uh, through the at symbols. So two ats represent the R configuration, and S is communicated by a single at symbol. So in our task is to return all possible stereoisomers. So we could do this as the following. So we define the operations to perform in a Python function uh, as shown here. 
uh, and this is achieved in just uh, 12 lines of code. So we named the function all stereoisomers and passed uh, the smile structure as an argument to the function. We could split the smiles uh, by uh, at each occurrence of at and only save um, uh, fragments of the smiles uh, which are non-empty. So let's give an example here. So we've broken up the smiles but at the, each of the stereogenic center. Okay, uh, we could calculate the number of stereogenic centers as um, the length of the list minus one because we have a stereogenic center between each of these fragments. Um, and we want to hypothesize or uh, provide all combinations of RNS configurations. So to do so, we could use um, the product function from uh, iter tools. Um, and uh, find all combinations of RNS configurations. So let's show what this may look like. So we've printed out all possible combinations of RNS at the five positions. Okay. Uh, given the fragments of the smiles and the all the possible uh, uh, stereoisomers or the uh, combination of stereogenic centers. Uh, we could iterate through those um, possibilities in a for loop and we would uh, 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 extend this um, uh, smiles and append it to the is uh, list uh, named isomers. Um, so what we want to do is like alternate the list between the fragments and the configuration. So for that, we use the zip uh, to pair uh, each of the item inside of these lists, uh, join them as a string, and then append that to an empty or uh, uh, initialized uh, string. And we could finally save that to um, the list. Give me a moment here. and return that list. So this would contain 32 strings. And as expected, if we print the length of the uh, generated list, we have 32 entries. And we could draw this using a RDKit function, uh, multi-grid image. So here we load each of the smiles from the um, from the list of recorded stereoisomers and load it to a RDKit molecule and pass that list of molecules to multigrid image. And now we have um, uh, all possible stereoisomers for that molecule drawn out alpha D glucose. So uh, for uh, when I was a, a, a teaching assistant in the chemistry department, if uh, students finish a worksheet fast, I would assign problems like this because it would take very long um, and I would use the rest of the hour. Um, we see that we could accomplish this in a very few lines of codes. Um, which are uh, simple and concise uh, and uh, a lot faster than doing it by hand. So I want to highlight that coding is valuable both as experimental and computational chemists. Uh, as an experimental chemist, I want to highlight that uh, coding is uh, yet another tool uh, that could be uh, useful for our research. Um, we could um, uh, enforce our findings uh, because um, uh, 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 using theoretical calculations access through code or computation. Um, also, um, this allows us to uh, fully leverage uh, databases. So we could, uh, for example, select a statistically validated set of benchmark molecules to target and expedite our investigation. Finally, uh, we also um, all perform uh, uh, analyses of our measured data. So um, this would all, um, implementing such analysis and code would uh, codify it and automate uh, such that um, it would, uh, it could uh, um, uh, 
uh, make such analyses faster and um, consistent. So I'd like to also highlight these with examples. So in terms of uh, um, automating some of the uh, uh, me measurements made through experimentation, I want to give an example for uh, assigning the uh, signals of a correlation spectroscopy spectrum to a known chemical structure. So here we have the cozy spectrum of N-acetylcadaverine, the structure of which is shown here. So certainly we could uh, manually um, assign these, uh, but if we, uh, uh, we could um, also aid the assignments through code. So, so let's say we save the unique chemical shifts as a dictionary in Python. So the ID or the, yeah, the idea of the unique chemical shift and the corresponding um, chemical shift value. Uh, and also we could save the cross peaks in a list of tuples. So um, between, um, we record the cross peaks between the unique chemical shifts. And we could visualize uh, the graph generated by uh, the correlation spectrum uh, using the um, uh, module network X. So here we build a network a graph through network X and add the unique chemical shifts as nodes of the graph, as well as um, the cross peaks as uh, edges that connect the nodes and draw out um, the generated this graph. Consistent with the known structure of N-acetylcadaverine, we have uh, four unique chemical shifts linearly connected and one isolated. So uh, this might provide a helpful means to uh, assign um, uh, uh, or analyze um, correlation spectroscopy spectra. Uh, also, Python is uh, useful for computational chemists uh, due to the flexibility of the Python operations. Uh, due to the ease of uh, coding, uh, we could quickly draft and test ideas, as well as uh, integrate our existing methodologies into a data science pipeline. So take, for example, we want to study the uh, uh, re uh, Claisen rearrangement reaction between uh, allophenol ether and 2-allophenol, shown here. So uh, we'll be varying the uh, carbon-carbon distance between these uh, two carbons um, and um, uh, perform a constrained geometry optimization to gather the energy profile of the reaction. So uh, for this, suppose we're starting with a, a, a particular conformer of allophenol ether shown here. So planar conformation and um, the reacting carbons are far from one another. So we could vary the carbon-carbon distance by moving um, this dihedral, the carbon-oxygen dihedral. Okay. So we're accomplishing this using the atomic simulation environment Python package. Uh, we could, uh, we have read the structure or the conformer from a file and viewed it um, using a visualizer. Um, the dihedral, which we want to vary, the ind atomic indices are uh, indicated here. And the atomic indices of uh, the atoms which accompany the rotation of the dihedral are also recorded. So um, if we're um, uh, preparing these uh, uh, 40 uh, intermediate conformers, uh, this may take a lot of time for manual preparation. So, uh, but we could accomplish this with code. So suppose we were varying from 180 to zero degrees and 40 steps. Uh, we could uh, calculate the size of the step um, in terms of uh, degrees and um, record the conformers to a list. Uh, from here, we use a, a for loop, uh, incrementing from 180 degrees to zero in a defined number of steps. We uh, use the set dihedral method of the atoms object loaded on atomic simulation environment. We provide the uh, dihedral ind index which we are rotating, the angle, 
in the indices of the atoms which accompany this rotation. We copy the confirmation and save it to the uh, list comps. Uh, so this would prepare the 40 uh, intermediate uh, conformers, and we could also record the carbon-carbon distance, which is what we're um, what we want to plot the reaction coordinates against, rather than a dihedral. So uh, here we have the uh, prepared conformers. And we see we see that uh, we're rotating the um, uh, the dihedral here and varying the carbon carbon distance between the reacting carbons, uh, and we see that we could vary it from four point nine five down to zero point nine eight. So we could write out these uh, conformers and um, uh, subject it to downstream. Um, uh, QM calculation with uh, constrained geometry optimization uh, and also atomic simulation environment itself provides an interface for performing such calculations. So we've um, uh, uh, shown how Python could be used both in an experimental and a computational lab. So Diego will further expand on the existing Python libraries as well as the uh, specific contents of the book. Thanks, Q. Uh, so yeah, as uh, after some of the examples that Q presented, I would like to introduce some concrete instances of Python libraries uh, that chemists be interested in. So these are some of the packages I personally used, and they have made by a large team across several institutions. Uh, so one example is NMR Glue. Uh, it's a, it is a platform for developing new methods uh, for processing, analyzing, and visualizing NMR data. Uh, it has the ability to read and write from different uh, kind of vendors, such as Broker, Agilent, uh, Varian. And it has several functions for processing NMR data, such as spectral shifting, Fourier, and other transformations baseline smoothing and flattening. I personally use it to analyze raw data from free induction decay uh, files and just try different ways of processing the raw data uh, from NMR. Uh, another one is OpenMM, uh, which is a high performance toolkit, toolkit sorry, for molecular simulation. Uh, the cool part about this one is that it is optimized to perform in the most recent GPUs and CPUs. So it doesn't, you don't need like a week or so to perform a molecular simulation. Uh, you can use uh, any sort of GPU from NVIDIA or AMD, uh, as so it would be a lot quicker. Also, in case you're interested in testing out a new force field for the interaction between atoms, uh, it has an um, interpreter so that you can put the force field you are interested in and just parse it as a string, as an expression. And the, the software will interpret it and use it as a force. And another one is psi uh, which is an uh, electronic structure program. And it implements quantum chemistry methods ranging from a hard tree fog and DFT to coupled cluster and configuration interaction. Uh, I personally like uh, to use Psi4 because it is very easy to integrate into my Python workflows without having to deal with input and output files. Um, so yeah, this one is very constantly, uh, uh, sorry, very frequently updated. So uh, they, they are trying very hard to uh, optimize it every, every new version, which I really like. Also it has a very active forum uh, for questions that anybody would have. So yeah, let's go to the next one. So yeah, right now I'm gonna uh, walk you through some of the personal experience that Kiyo and I have run into when trying to learn Python. And it's very easy to get caught into this uh, Python 101 courses or tutorials that you can find in places like Udemy or Audacity or YouTube. So 
it's very common to just go to a Python tutorial and you see uh, stuff like how to print a hello world or how to deal with a list of items. And I can guarantee you, you will always see fruits when you look on how to deal with, with lists. So here we have a list that has three items, apple, banana, and cucumber. And we add a new fruit called durian. And then we want to see how many items we have in our list. So yeah, we have four items in the shopping list. Shopping list. So how can we use this for our workflow in chemistry? How, how does this have anything to do with, uh, with chemistry? Another example, which is very common, especially if you're interested in machine learning, is to deal with scikit-learn, which is a library used for uh, implementing machine learning uh, algorithms. And here we look at the iris data set, uh, which is a set of flowers from the genus of iris. And usually this is used as an example of uh, classification for machine learning. So he would be interested in uh, using the features such as the length and width of the petals to classify a flower as Setosa or the other species. Uh, I forgot, Vir Virginia or I forgot the names of the species, but it is used as a way to classify. So, I mean, this is very interesting, but how can I relate this to my data? Let's say if I want to look at an inventory of the chemicals in my lab or uh, how do I algorithmically uh, generate a table from my data from some output files from a quantum chemistry calculation or a molecular dynamic simulation? So these are kind of the questions we were kind of daunted when we started learning Python. And some of the lessons we have learned is that, well, coding looks a little bit uh, abstract. It looks like a difficult language. It looks like German when you only speak Spanish or uh, English. Uh, but coding itself is not difficult because we can look at uh, problems that are very, very difficult or complicated and look impossible to solve. But uh, the cool part is that we just need to break them into uh, smaller and more feasible problems. And at the end of the day, it's just about trying out, right? So it's just about writing the code. And I wouldn't say that you have to fake it until you make it. I prefer to say break it until you make it. So just grab a piece of code and try to change it to your personal preference and you will see how you're gonna break it. And then it's all about trying to figure out how to not break it, right? And yeah, we are, or the idea that perfectionism is not very, uh, uh, it, it wouldn't be very helpful, especially as a beginner, because we think that finished code means functioning code, not perfect code. So as some previous advisor once told me, uh, perfect is the opposite of done, right? Uh, so yeah, we think that finished code just that means functioning code. Uh, so yeah, now the next one. Um, so yeah, all of these lessons motivated us to write a research to train chemists to learn Python. And this is now called Python for Chemists. Uh, we noticed that there are many resources available for to learn chemistry or Python by themselves. Uh, but the amount of resources can be overwhelming. Uh, there's so many tutorials and so many ways to do it. And the greatest barrier as a chemist was to apply Python in a relevant way into your research, into your chemistry research. And we have experience, I think both Kia and me, we have experience in math and biology and physics. Uh, personally, I come from a physics, physics background. And we noticed that, for example, in bio biology programs, they include dry lab uh, components for bioinformatics. And in my case, physics programs and math pro programs, uh, they have, they have uh, a couple of semesters of uh, computational uh, physics in which we learn how to solve differential equations, for example, or numerical linear algebra. So yeah, it, it is a common experience for chemists to earn a degree with very little computational experience. And so computation is very, not very widely valued uh, in chemistry education programs. And 
Well, apart from this kind of problem, uh, we also noticed that, well, personally, I knew there was a problem with uh, reproducibility in science, specifically in social science, like psychology. Uh, but Akio just shared with me this, uh, this article and it turns out that there's also a reproducibility program, problem in natural science, so uh, including chemistry. And as you will see in this article, uh, one of the main issues for the re reproducibility is that there is not a very good understanding of the statistics, uh, which is a, mean, is a mean to address the reproducibility of data. So we think that chemists can gain further understanding of uh, statistics uh, through interacting with large data sets, uh, especially using code. And well, yeah, as computation and informatics become increasingly important in a chemist's career, we wanted a resource for all chemists to access code uh, and with Python as the starting language. As we saw, it has very good features such as the readability and the ease of implementation as Kyo showed in some tutorials. Uh, so yeah, uh, let me just talk about what this book is about and probably it's just best to start with just telling you what this book is not about. So yeah, this is not a comprehensive uh, document for Python or chemistry. So please don't expect to be uh, like top software uh, developers after you finish the last page of the book. Uh, also, we are not going to teach uh, the basics of chemistry. We assume some knowledge of chemistry, but uh, we kind of try to give the background of each of the problems we walk through. Uh, this, it mainly consists of many anecdotes or examples of our experience as researchers and uh, problems that we try to solve from an algorithmic uh, point of view using Python. We will guide you through some chemical problems that can be solved uh, by algorithms. And the main part that I think I would like to highlight about this book is that uh, we provide some examples that we personally uh, had or we have in mind, but you can just use this code and interact with it. As I said, just, just break it until you make it again, right? So you can try this code in your own research and uh, change the code. You can, you can go from easy stuff from like just changing the color of a bond from red to blue or doing some more complicated stuff like implementing a force field for a molecular dynamics simulation or anything you would be interested in. So we think we made a document that is very interactive in the sense that you would just grab the examples and just uh, adapt, them, adapt them to your own research. So yeah, the way we broke down these chapters, I mean the, the book, is in, in five chapters. So we, we start with begin coding in base Python. That's the name of the first chapter. And it mainly has to do with uh, the basics of like the bread and butter of Python, right? Which is variables and how to control variables in loops and the conditional statements. Then we move on to data analysis in Python in which we learn to operate on more complicated objects like arrays or data tables. Uh, then we move on to chem informatics, uh, which we use to extract information from individual molecules. And also we try to look at methods of how to compare mo individual molecules to large data sets uh, without having to consume too much uh, computation uh, time. Uh, we look at uh, machine learning on chemical data. So yeah, we, how can we talk about uh, Python in chemistry without machine learning? Uh, so yeah, we have a chapter dedicated to this in which we work through several examples of how to implement a machine learning project uh, with chemical data. And finally, we look at a little bit more complicated problems such as uh, how to perform a quantum uh, chemistry, uh, sorry, an electronic structure calculation, such as a simple single point calculation or an optimization of geometry, as well as how to solve a differential equation for a reaction. So we do this in chapter five. So this is kind of the quick uh, run through, but let me just talk about each chapter uh, individually into more detail. So yeah, in the first chapter, begin coding in base Python, 
as I said, we look at the basic pieces of the puzzle, which are numerical variables and operations and string variables and operations. So we do this in a way that uh, we try to relate this to your experience as chemists. So string operations, as we saw, I mean, string variables, they can be like the fruits, right? Banana, apple, orange. But what about uh, sequences of amino acids? We can also implement them there. So maybe you are interested in a certain portion of an, an, of an sorry, of a protein, and you want to extract these strings, like substrings from a larger string. That may be one case you're interested in. Uh, so these are kind of the basic pieces, and also uh, how do we merge them together? So we can use functions. So let's say you want to use a function called factorial, which calculates a factorial of a, a number, but instead of just repeating the function, how to implement the function every time, you can just define it at the beginning of your code and then just copy it every time you need it, like just calling factorial parentheses two or something like that. Uh, we can also use conditional statements and loops to control the flow of the program. So even in my, even my factorial function, if I receive a, like a very large number, that would be very hard to calculate the factorial for, I can just return an error message like saying, oh, your number is too big, I cannot calculate that. So that would be like a conditional statement. If the number is too big, I will receive this output. And we can also do the loops also in the same factorial program. Uh, so instead of uh, writing a line every time we want to multiply a number, we can grab a number and just do a loop until we uh, reach one, for example. So factorial six would be you multiply six by five, by four, by three, and so on. So instead of doing all those lines of codes, we just define a single loop. So those are the kind of things we cover in this base Python. It's kind of Python without the addition of fancy packages and do it. So let's go to the next one. Yeah, so in, in the second chapter, we deal with more complicated data types, uh, data that can be uh, in the form of arrays or tables. And we specifically look at the, at the library NumPy, which is used to perform linear algebra operations. So some of the examples we're working through in this chapter is calculating the RMSD uh, for a molecule, I mean, for a set of uh, 3D conformers, which is a way to calculate or quantify the geometric dissimilarity so we can perform all of this by using Python, I mean, by using NumPy. Also, for example, you, like the example that Theo had, like rotating a molecule, we can also do that using just a matrix multiplication if you want to rotate the entire molecule. Uh, so we can also implement that in, in NumPy. Uh, another library that we also use is Pandas for data analysis. So here we look at, I mean, I think we are as scientists from all levels, from undergrad to uh, tenure professors, we are very constantly looking at Excel and uh, data tables. And I think uh, Pandas could provide a way of extracting information, a way of dealing with large amounts of data without having to manually inspect uh, and search in a data table. So we will look at some operations in Pandas, such as the intersection between two uh, tables, how to extract rows or columns, and, and so on. And finally, uh, when we look at complicated data, sometimes it's kind of overwhelming when we, we look at all the individual cells and rows. So we think that visualization, I mean, a picture would say a lot more, and maybe we can find something new by visualizing our data. So we use, uh, we introduce the Seaborn library for visualization. So here's an example of uh, the data for a CCS, I mean, collisional cross-section data set. And we can see that in some of the cells, we see an, a correlation. That is, we see like a, some sort of linear trend. And these mostly correspond to the mass. Uh, if we plot the collisional cross-section versus the mass of the molecule, then we will see a correlation, which kind of makes sense, right? The, the heavier the molecule, the larger will be like the the shadow of it, right? 
So yeah, these are kind of the things we are working through in this chapter. You now let's go to the chapter three. So in chapter three is can informatics, and as you saw in the previous slides by Kiyo, uh, I think it was a glucose molecule, and he had like an expression, like C uh, parentheses, square parentheses, and some different symbols. So we talk about this language, the smiles and the smarts language, which is a way to easily and shortly encode a molecule into a string. Um, and then we use the RDKit module, uh, which is made for cheminformatics, uh, to extract information from atoms, bonds, and uh, individual molecules. So we want to see how many double bonds our molecule has. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, I'm gonna, <laughs> gonna be, I, I'm about to finish it. Um, yeah, and we also look at uh, how do we, this, do we do this in larger data sets, right? So we, do, we look at molecular fingerprints, like this image that we see here, which is a way to encode information from the molecule into a, a simple vector of ones and zeros. So yeah, we have some examples of, I, we have an example of um, uh, the taste data set in which they have uh, molecules from different tastes like uh, sour, sorry, as bitter and sweet. And I had a question, is a sour molecule like citric acid gonna come going to be similar to any of these molecules. And well, it turns out that uh, bitter molecules are more similar to other bitter molecules, right? And we do this by uh, using fingerprints in a large data set. Okay, let's, I think I need to hurry up, so yeah. Yeah, and the fourth chapter, we look at different uh, machine learning implementations from uh, supervised learning, such as regression and classification, in which we are trying to predict one quantity or one label of a molecule. And so we gave, gave some examples of um, uh, to classify molecules into whether they are inhibitors or not of the uh, enzyme uh, based one, which is very involved into the Alzheimer's disease. So one example of classification is in there and also regression. Uh, for example, we can use, use this to classify, to calculate what would be the toxicity, predicted toxicity of a molecule. Uh, we also look at examples of unsupervised learning like dimensionality reduction, in which we kind of try to look at the, all the features of a data set and without knowing anything about the data set, just try to see whether uh, some molecules group together in a cluster or in different clusters. And also we look at anomaly detection uh, to have a look at our data. Maybe we have some data in our data set that is not very reliable and we have, we have like very outlier, uh, some points that are outliers from a reason we still don't know, but it's a way to, to identify them. Uh, let's go to chapter five. So yeah, finally chapter five is, uh, we look at a little bit more complicated examples, how to deal with computational chemistry files uh, from input and output, uh, how to solve differential equations uh, from, a, um, from a reaction using the package SciPy. Uh, we also use the package ASC, which is an interface for different uh, computational chemistry programs. And how, so we will see how to perform a single point calculation, how to perform an, a geometry optimization. And finally, we would look at BioPython for how to deal with a molecular biomolecular structure uh, uh, data, sorry, input files, like from PDB or crystallography. So yeah, I hope we still have some time. So I'm gonna hand it back to Kio for the conclusions. Oh. Yeah, so yeah, this is, these are kind of the, the libraries we're using uh, in case you're interested in looking, looking at them into more detail, we have Python, NumPy for linear algebra, pandas for data tables, Seaborn for visualization, RDKit for uh, chem informatics, scikit learn for machine learning, SciPy for general, more complicated scientific functions, ASE as an interactive way to deal with uh, quantum chemistry programs, and BioPython for uh, computational molecular biology. So yeah, uh, now I'm gonna hand it back to hand it back to. Thank you very much, Diego.
So uh, in conclusion, uh, we uh, discussed the increasing importance of uh, using algorithmic solutions in chemistry research. Python in particular presents a low barrier of entry to uh, begin coding, uh, drafting ideas, and testing them. So uh, Python for chemists intends to help ke uh, chemists uh, develop the intuition to approach chemical problems uh, 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 with the algorithmic uh, framing um, to access um, uh, uh, even more methodologies. And uh, Python for Chemist is available through institutional access or individual copy on the Google Play Store, uh, which Nathan uh, will expand on. And uh, let's see, we'd like to thank the um, outstanding uh, uh, production, uh, editing, and marketing team at ACS. And this presentation was prepared using Jupyter Notebook with the RISE uh, extension uh, for presentation mode. Uh, thank you, and I'll hand it to Nathan. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna share my last slide here. So uh, I believe you can see it. Uh, so as Kyo mentioned, you can purchase uh, individual copies uh, with that QR code on the left or the link in the chat that's through Google Play, where you can um, purchase access to the whole collection, uh, the ACS in Focus series uh, for your whole institution with the code on the right. Again, uh, the link is in the chat. Um, we are running out of time for questions. However, if Keo and Diego are amenable to it, we can answer some of the ones that are in the chat and that'll show up on the recording. So if you have to leave at the end of the hour here, um, the recording will still be emailed to you and any of the questions will be answered in that recording. Um, so without further ado, why don't we get into some of those questions? Um, so the open questions from the chat? Yes, yeah, so I can read them to okay. you or, or you can read them out loud as well. Yeah, I think I can. So there's a question that is, is Psy4 available as a Python library in Jupyter environment, for example? And the answer is, uh, yeah, you can just import Psy4 <coughs> as a library and then just use it in your Jupyter notebooks. Uh, you can also use it as a standalone program, although I prefer to use it just as we saw from Psy4 import, I don't know, certain function or import Psy4. 